Good morning, everybody. We know you're all enjoying mingling with each other, but we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Welcome to the fifth annual Research Park Big Data Summit. We are excited to have you all here, some familiar faces that have been part of the Research Park over the many years of working together as a tech community. As the director of the Research Park at the University of Illinois, I'm proud to welcome you both to campus and to the Research Park. For those of you who are alumni, welcome back to your alma mater. You hopefully have some orange to declare your loyalty as well on your name tags and mingle amongst each other. Um, please do spend the time to get to know each other. We've intentionally left some breakout space in the back, so if you want to have conversations, you can do so as well. So the research park here in this time of five years of doing this has had tremendous growth. We're at record occupancy and employment here in the park with now more than 110 companies and 2,000 employees, a mixture of more than 600 students working out here with full-time professionals, and those are folks from many areas, especially when it comes to a topic like data sciences and data analytics. It broadly pulls from many areas of expertise from campus to make it possible to be successful. So we're really proud of this community of companies and industry partners that have worked with the University of Illinois and chosen our university to be the place that will be at the forefront of innovation and specifically for today, in many cases, cutting edge work in data analytics. So it's very fitting today that we'll have a convergence of our friends, both from industry and from faculty and from students, sharing some of their experiences of how they're making strides in data analytics. We hope that you appreciate seeing some trends, some cutting edge research, and some applications within business. And if you see something you like, please encourage you to, I want to encourage you to share that. We do have a hashtag today. It's hashtag BigData17, so please use that if you're Twitter friendly. And keep the mo momentum going with us. We have a great uh, CU Data Sciences user group, which is a group that comes together every month, the first Friday of the month, to talk about data science topics. We have industry speakers and faculty speakers, and I'd like to give a thank you to Professor Robert Brunner and to Matt Ahrens from OAT who carefully curate those discussions and bring a lot of friends along board with us every month as we have peer discussions. The next one will be in the first Friday in December, so come out and join us for this continued dialogue beyond this event each year. But today this summit is possible because of two other groups. One, I'd like to thank our crew from the Research Park that has put a lot of love into making this event happen, so thank you to all the staff. Laura Blyle, Jenny Kim, newly joined Kathy MacArthur, Alyssa, one of our interns, and many others that contributed to the success of this event. And it wouldn't happen at all without our sponsors. So a huge thank you to CME Group, to Synchrony Financial, and John Deere for generously supporting this event and making it possible for all of us to attend for free. So it's now my pleasure to introduce a leader from CME Group who will be our morning keynote speaker. David Gresky is Senior Director and Head of Market Technology Sales of Americas at CME Group. <laughs> Say a little bit more about you, but wanted to get your face on the screen as well. David oversees the efforts to grow the CME Group Data, Software, Co-Location, and Connectivity businesses. His role has spanned several sales and development capacities but prior to this, he spent five years in algorithmic trading technology at ITIV IT, and before that, he ran sales and engineering team. Uh, he also has an interesting background, I believe, related to the Chicago Cubs, um, so I think that there's a, a reference to be able to shout out there as well. Um, he worked on derivatives trading in a London-based trading firm, Sequoia Capital. Please join me in welcoming David Gretzky. Thank you, Laura, and thank you to the entire Research Park for allowing CME to uh, be part of this today. We're, we're definitely very excited and uh, wasn't planning on talking about the Cubs, but if someone wants to talk about that, that's a, that's a distant, distant. I, didn't, I played a couple of years in the, uh, the minor league system for the Cubs. It was a long time ago. It was different. It was actually, all right, fine. We'll, we'll go off key already. So um, we have a Tech Talk event every year. Um, 
the CME throws, that talks about a lot of the emerging technology that's happening in our industry, we invite a lot of our customers and a lot of our thought leaders. And this year, we were actually uh, lucky enough to get Jed Hoyer uh, to come in, who's the general manager of the Cubs, and he came in and he talked about it for uh, about 30 minutes before a game um, in September, before the playoffs kicked off. And just some of the things he was talking about around data and analytics were absolutely um, really, really interesting. So the, the one point I think that needs to get across in, in hopefully a lot of the presentations that you guys hear today is that it's almost regardless of indus industry that you're currently in today, data and analytics are, uh, to some degree, um, a, a very, very, very important part of, of corporations um, and their future and where they're going. One quick question I will, or one quick story I will share that uh, Judd shared was um, during the World Series, um, when the rain delay happened, he immediately ran down to the locker room along with uh, Theo and the general manager for the Indians, Rob Manfred, who is the MLB commissioner. They had all the umpires in a room with, I think it was Fox uh, Broadcasting, and they got in that room together to determine exactly what they're gonna do. Are they gonna cancel the game or are they not? And the interesting thing that, that Jed had shared with everybody at that point in time is he was afraid to look up at the guys uh, who ran the Indians because he knew that in the next couple of minutes, whatever decision was made, it was going to kind of make or break these guys. And, and he had such respect because you interact with these guys on a regular basis that he was afraid to look them in the eye because he just knew that someone had to be the winner and someone had to be the loser. But um, it was really interesting to kind of hear, like, um, he said a fly in the wall in that meeting was actually really interesting. But anyway, we could talk about that later. And some really cool, if there's any baseball fans out there, some really cool analytics that they shared with us as well. So. Let me get to why I'm actually here today. Um, so, long story short, uh, CME Group. So, again, my name is David Gresky. I run market technology sales for CME Group in the Americas. What we do is we assist our customers in accessing our markets, um, our various different commercialized technology, so that they're actually able to trade our markets. So, um, this is our corporate communication slide. What is CME Group? We are um, the largest derivatives exchange in the world, uh, futures and options. Um, a lot of people don't know that. We trade over three billion contracts on an annual basis, uh, one quadrillion dollars in terms of notional value. Um, we're ultimately a marketplace. We bring buyers and sellers together to trade risk on futures and options across all of our various different asset classes. That would be um, interest rates, uh, FX futures, equity indices, um, agriculture, energy. So when people talk about the price of corn or the, or the price of oil or euro dollars or S&P e-minis, this is where they come. This is where they come to manage their risk. We are open 24, almost 24 seven, like 23 and a half hours a day, I think, five days a week. So when the election happened, um, we were the beneficiary of NYSE and NASDAQ being closed at that time and people coming to our markets. Um, a funny story that I often share is anytime you hear anything in the, in the press about maybe any of the equity exchanges being down, New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ has an issue that day with their technology, I always get a call from my mom um, saying, hey, David, are you okay? Are you guys all right? And I'm just like, <laughs> Yeah, mom, we're good. Yeah, in fact, we're the beneficiaries of a lot of that. So oh, most people don't understand that, but I'm glad to share it. So, um, data. Um, there are basically four things that I want to discuss with you in this opening uh, part. Um, one is fintech partnerships, historical data, alternative data, and Bitcoin data, which is kind of top of mind right now. So, before we're able to actually get any of our data out there and distribute it out to the world uh, from our perspective, it's very important for us to have financial technology partnerships um, with lots of different sorts of firms. I mean, there's an ecosystem of hundreds of different types of firms in the software industry, back office technologies, uh, risk technologies that allow people to interact with our markets. But a couple that I wanted to highlight that we're particularly proud of um, are a few on this slide, one of which is uh, FinTech Sandbox. This is an accelerator based in Boston, Massachusetts that basically helps fintech um, firms that are trying to bring products to market and solve problems get access to data for free. Uh, we make our data available to those uh, participants. Innovate Finance, similarly, another accelerator in London. Um, CME Ventures, CME Ventures is actually CME's um, venture arm where we invest in a lot of emerging technologies that we think are gonna be potentially crucial to our markets in the two to five year uh, time frame. Um, AWS, um, we do a lot in the cloud today. You'll hear a couple of my colleagues talk about it um, later today, but AWS is, a, is currently our preferred cloud partner. 
um, and helps us um, do and power a lot of our applications, uh, some of which are, are customer facing. But then Google Cloud is another one that um, is starting to come up and that we're also taking a very close look at. We just recently announced a partnership where they're putting their um, a direct point of presence in our data center in Aurora, Illinois for customers to be able to leverage uh, computational, or basically leverage a direct connection to their cloud for different types of computational needs that they have. And then a couple others are QuickStrike, which is an options analytics tool embedded into our front end platform, and then TickSmith, which uh, helps us power uh, the next thing I'm gonna speak about with our historical data. So we have real-time data, but historical data is important to us. It's not a massive uh, revenue generator for CME, but what it is is it sits at the front door of a lot of places um, that people interact with our market. Before anyone's ever gonna trade, the first thing they wanna look at is data. They wanna understand, ultimately, am I gonna be able to make money? What would my strategy be? Um, what are the trends that are in something? And because of that, we um, went on a project, I would say about two years ago, to make it easier for people to get access to our data. Um, we launched last October 2016 our cloud platform that allows uh, self-service 24-7, 365 access to CME's various commercialized data sets. This goes from end-of-day data, once-a-day settlements, all the way through to each individual packet that goes over the network for people to recreate the entire order book and the history of what's happened there. So we're particularly proud of this because when we start talking about data, you know, CME, we have a pretty large amount of financial data. I think our, our, our data category, our library right now is over 450 terabytes of data, which pales in comparison to the, the total data uh, in finance in general, but it is something that we're, you know, getting more and more interest in making it easier for our customers to get access to smaller amounts of data as well as larger amounts of data. Um, the, as I said before, it is self-service, um, but we continue to improve it, offering Python APIs, query APIs, just ways to be able to cater to the entire marketplace because we'll have investment banks, proprietary trading firms, hedge funds, all the way down to you know, your uncle you know, who might want data for some particular reason and universities um, who come to us on a regular basis because they have research projects and they need to get as, uh, access to data um, so that they can complete those. Moving on, on the heels of what we're doing in historical data is alternative data. This has actually been something that's been pretty prevalent for the last year and a half, two years in the financial markets industry. Um, alternative data can really be um, defined as non-traditional data that's utilized um, to make investment or trading decisions. Um, otherwise, it could just be called data, right? Um, fact of the matter is, um, some common examples that are starting to be utilized are things like satellite data, web scraping, credit card data, um, geospatial, weather, all of that sort of stuff to give people a, a, a larger view of what's actually happening in the world and educate them a little bit better so they're able to make the decisions that they need to make um, for their businesses. Ultimately, data is the lifeblood of our business. Uh, without data, our customers can't make decisions. They can't trade. They can't manage their risk. So data is a very important aspect to everything that we do. Um, and alternative data is, is one that we're, we're starting to look very closely at. This is an example of um, oil floating roof uh, tank storage um, provided by a company uh, named Orbital Insight who actually is a uh, in our portfolio with CME Ventures that we're invested in. And this is what they do. They give you a global landscape of, of on any given day, uh, the oil storage across China, the United States, uh, South America, Russia, uh, Europe, to give people an indicator of roughly where they, they think that velocity of, of, of data is going. Another example that I think you're gonna hear and it's gonna be a little bit more relevant today is in, is in the application of agriculture is looking at overall you know, satellite footage and different ways that people are utilizing technology to help them be more efficient in the decisions that they, the business decisions that they make. A lot of the participants that come to our market, we're an ancillary place where they just go to manage risk. It's not their core business on a regular basis, but there's a lot of technology and data out there that's starting to be generated and starting to be fostered for them to, to better be able to make those decisions. And, and we wanna be at the forefront and continue to kind of evaluate this in, in ways that we can help get these sorts of technology companies that are up and coming um, out to our customer base so people are aware of them. And the last example is um, some shipping data um, that's out there for people who would be looking at either economic, um, wartime, um, sort of uh, things that are happening out there in the world or, or how weather can impact certain economic chains that are coming through. The last thing that I'm gonna um, speak about, at least from a data perspective for CME, is Bitcoin. Um, anyone who follows CME Group in the last couple of weeks, we made an announcement two weeks ago that CME is going to launch a futures contract that's gonna be based on Bitcoin. Um, in Q4, regulatory approval uh, pending uh, on this particular one. But ultimately, um, 
we started working on Bitcoin um, back in, I want to say, probably late 2015, early 2016, where we established a reference rate called our B, uh, BRR with a company by the name of Crypto Facilities based in London, where ultimately what we do is we pull in the spot prices from a number of the leading Bitcoin exchanges, and we try to provide um, a certain methodology around it to show what that common price of Bitcoin across the, um, across the landscape is at any given time. It's a one, once a day rate that's published. In addition to that, we did start offering a real time index as well, so customers can actually connect to us to get this data. Um, and, and be able to see throughout a given day kind of where Bitcoin is, is moving and utilizing. Um, this is an example of exactly what we do, pulling it in um, with our methodologies and the data that comes through, and then through our own distribution channels. We have a couple different ones, of course, we have our website, but then we have our historical data platform, as I mentioned before. Um, the reason that's important there is because that's actually our first foray into broadcasting live market data to the cloud. We've never done that before, um, but Bitcoin market is a 24-7, 365 market, and our systems on the future side are usually down on the weekends. So um, this is another sort of way that we're, we're moving forward with, with things related to that. So moving on, the last thing I will mention today is CME's involvement here um, at the Research Park. Uh, we do have an innovation center um, that is on campus here. Uh, we have been here for, I want to say, over a year, about a year now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and ultimately, we recognize U of I as a resource of talent, uh, local talent, that we're looking to uh, partner with and we're, and we're looking for people to be part of our team. Um, right now we're building some cross-functional teams across analytics and machine learning. We're looking across the board at all levels from freshmen to PhD candidates. So if anything that I've discussed today piques your interest, this is only a very small slice of all the things that we're doing at CME. Um, please uh, reach out to Wes Cravens. He's actually here in the audience today. He'll be around the rest of the day today. He is actually our, our site officer here, uh, our site director here uh, at U of I, um, and he's actually based here all the time. So we really sincerely appreciate being able to be part of this. Um, again, if anything's interesting and you guys want to talk a little bit later, I'm glad to get further in depth. But outside of that, I'm, I'm interested in learning from you guys and uh, interested in the program today. So thank you very much. Anybody have any questions and want to learn a little bit more about CME before he leaves the stage? If nothing from the peanut gallery yet, we're just trying to warm you up. He will be on a panel coming up, so ask it then if you thought of something. I know there are a lot of folks working in cryptocurrencies as an example, and it was great to hear more of those examples. And I know we also have a lot of faculty working on those alternative data sources, whether it's crop data or supply chain and other areas across the university. So I hope we can figure out how to contribute to those emerging sources. So thank you again, David, and thank you again to CME Group for your support of this event as our title sponsor today. It's now my pleasure to make a bit of a shift from large company to a startup company. And that's very much the fabric of the research park is to have both, mixing together, hopefully both pushing one another at the limits of what can happen. And it's important for us today to recognize a startup company that came out of the University of Illinois, two students who had a great idea, and probably most important that they saw that there was a need in the marketplace, a chance to really create disruption in an area that needed it and that was lagging in technology adoption. So two students from two different areas of the university came together to form a company that has now become our largest company in the incubator, and they have offices in South Carolina and Chicago as well now, and have raised venture capital funding. So a bit of a change from what was in your original program, we had Ashke, the C CTO of the company and co-founder speaking, but I'm excited we have the CEO and founder today, Christian Brenner, uh, who, will, Berner, who will be speaking to us, and he started Quick at Solutions, as I said, when he was in school, graduated, grew the team, has customers, revenue, importantly, and is uh, rolling out a number of data platform technologies to help law enforcement hopefully make us all safer. So please join me in welcoming Christian to the Big Data Summit.
Well, good morning, everyone. So my name again is Christian Berner. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Quicket Solutions. Um, my other co-founder, uh, Akshay, my chief technology officer as well, unfortunately wasn't able to be here today. We're doing a uh, major deploy uh, deployment for one of the largest cities in South Carolina right now. So I'm here though. Um, we have an office that's based in the research park. Um, and so I'm oftentimes in this area as well. So this is a quick background about the company and then we're gonna get into some of the, I think, really cool applications that uh, Quicket Solutions is building. Um, a brief background, we have offices. Um, we started here at Enterprise Works in the research park. We still have a uh, office there today. Um, but actually, we got started in my apartment, uh, my sophomore year of college. Um, got the ideas originally for my freshman year internship. Um, and then from there, recruited people. Um, Myself, I'm a uh, College of Business alumni, but kind of a self-learned coder myself, but then also I realized that I really needed some engineering talent, of course, to help build out the product, and so that's how I found my co-founder and CTO who was pursuing his master's degree in computer and electrical um, engineering here at the university. Um, so myself, my co-founder, and pretty much every single original member of my team is uh, from U of I. So no coincidence, our logo is orange and blue for that reason. Um, but now we've, uh, we've had a lot of exciting expansion uh, since I graduated in 2015. Um, and now that we have three offices, um, one here, one in Chicago, and one in Columbia, South Carolina, if not the country. Um, um, and right before we graduated, we had raised um, almost about a million dollars. Um, but now, to date, a couple years later, we've raised about five million. And so, as Laura was saying, is that we, at this point now, are um, generating revenue. We have a number of clients across multiple states, across the country, and I guess we're kind of at the at a position now as a company to, um, in Q1 of next year, start pursuing our Series A financing. Okay, so provide a little bit of background um, about my company. So. Um, I think probably everyone would agree with this, is that uh, government is drowning in data. Um, and this is a core tenant about what our company is aiming to solve. Um, paperwork still dominates almost every single workflow in local government, um, whether it's uh, the court, law enforcement, code enforcement, um, the permit process. So many different processes, and I'm sure many of you touch um, on a regular basis, they live in a world of paper. Um, and they, in the field, because as you can imagine, as many of these, um, uh, whether it be a law enforcement officer, code enforcement in the field, they don't have any type of, field, um, any type of capabilities to capture data in the field. And so even though many of these uh, local government agencies have records management systems and other ways to ultimately store the data. They're not doing the data capture in the field, which is oftentimes um, imperative to have quality data flowing through to all the different stakeholders in the ecosystem. Um, further, what we have, of course, discovered, and I think this is no surprise, is that um, most of local government um, does not even have an IT department. Um, they have part-time IT people, and so Generally speaking, is um, in order to build comprehensive um, information systems, in order to build comprehensive systems to capture, store, and analyze data, this is where Quicket comes in. Um, and what we re what we aim to do is partner with the public sector um, so that we can provide these comprehensive solutions so that um, ultimately they dramatically increase the efficiency and effectiveness of their operations and then ultimately better serve us as residents and citizens of our community. Okay, so Quicket actually um, got started originally in the law enforcement space. Um, now, when I approach customers today, I don't tell them the real reason why I got inspired to start the company. Um, but the real reason I can tell you today is um, I've gotten a few tickets in my lifetime. Um, everything from a parking ticket to a speeding ticket um, to other moving violations of sorts. Um, nothing worse than that. Um, but point being, though, is this um, 
I realized just how unbelievably tedious of a process that was. Um, not just simply for me, because I had a court appearance required, I was going pretty fast on one of my tickets, um, but also just um, realizing how complicated the back end of this was. So how it currently is with a lot of um, law enforcement today is you'll get pulled over at a traffic stop and they're going to issue you a carbon copy ticket. Okay, so you get one copy, the defendant copy, another copy is for the court, another copy is for the police station, another copy is for the Secretary of State, right? So all these different carbon copies, now assuming I'm an in-state violator, then go to the appropriate court, Secretary of State jurisdiction. Gets even more complicated though, as you can imagine, if you're an out-of-state violator. In fact, in one of the jurisdictions uh, we're working in South Carolina, uh, it was found that 93% of the citations for out-of-state violators were not being sent to other Secretary of State um, databases on time. Because of course, all this data is captured by hand, it's mailed, it's <laughs> manually entered into records management systems, and so not only is this whole process incredibly prone to error and illegibility, of course, because it's uh, oftentimes chicken scratch handwriting, um, but it poses a huge problem in being able to effectively share uh, this data in one central solution. Um, the other key important thing that we realized was that there was no type of real-time intelligence capability. Now, there's a lot of systems out there that can take existing data sets and start you know, doing analyses on that data, but what we really realized was that there wasn't a system that was capturing the data in the field tickets or otherwise, but capturing the stay in the field and being able to then provide real-time intelligence to the police officers in the field <clears throat> and also the command staff back at the station. Um, and furthermore, of course, then is the data was incredibly difficult to share, um, not just simply with the external stakeholders, but even among stakeholders within their department. For a report approval process, it usually would be emailing reports back to each other putting a physical piece of paper on a commander's desk so they can review an incident report is an incredibly antiquated system. So, uh, Quicket, um, I, I think uh, everyone is aware that uh, the subscription economy is really starting to uh, cause massive disruption across the B2B and the B2C space. Now, Quicket, though, is 100% focused on the B2G space. And really is what we've seen is um, today, there aren't really um, that many systems out there. I mean, beyond the simple um, cloud-based like Office 365 um, or other type of like email or basic, um, basic services, there are a few products out there today that are really um, aiming to disrupt the public sector space with a SaaS-based, cloud-based approach to information management and analysis. So uh, Quicket in uh, 2015 actually became, um, we're built on the Amazon Web Services um, infrastructure. Um, GovCloud is the particular partition we use to handle and manage this type of isolated data. But Quicket was actually the first company in 2015 to become uh, deemed compliant and certified by the FBI to be able to handle all of law enforcement sensitive data in the cloud. And so what that meant was that we were able to, for the first time, truly migrate a lot of this sensitive data from their on-premise server infrastructure within these police departments, um, um, county sheriffs, and other type of um, law enforcement jurisdictions and move it completely into the cloud. Um, we have ultimately now deployed a solution as to where, whether you're using a tablet, your in-car computer, all that data now is synced now to our cloud and we're able to share that now with all the stakeholders of law enforcement. So after, after deploying successfully to a number of agencies um, here in Illinois, um, we kind of took a step back and really realized that, and going back to one of my first slides, is that we, we realized that it's not just law enforcement, it's really gover uh, local government as a whole is drowning in data, that there isn't really one solution out there, there isn't one company that, that was out there that was 100% focused on migrating 
all these sensitive workloads to the cloud. And so Quicket now has successfully deployed a number of solutions with law enforcement, code enforcement, the judicial system or the courts, um, finance, and then what we call our e-government applications, um, including uh, permits, online payment processing, email and text alerts. We do a number of those things also in our platform. So kind of how the current um, environment looks like versus what Quicket is now doing today. Um, there, there have been some fundamental shifts in how we're managing um, and partnering ultimately with the public sector to deliver solutions for them. So as it was previously, you'd have each local government agency or consortium of agencies that would come together and manage all of their data. They'd manage all the infrastructure, they'd manage all of the in-house software development to develop these records management type solutions. They would manage then also all the security concerns as well. Quicket has really fundamentally changed that with our partnership here with Amazon Web Services and that now for a client, um, we are the ones managing now the entire infrastructure for them. We're ensuring that uh, the, um, the encryption, firewalls, um, and then of course the software applications are totally configured for them. And then Amazon for us, and this is I think very exciting for local government, is they've never been able to take advantage of multi-billion dollar infrastructure before. Uh, they've never been able to take advantage um, of this global infrastructure that's able to deliver for them unbelievable amounts of computational gains, uh, the storage capabilities, and of course, things like disaster recovery capabilities. Um, in central Illinois a couple years ago, um, there was a pretty terrible tornado that blew through a courthouse and actually destroyed 200 plus years of records. Um, and this is what we see all across the country, is that we have individual servers in like the police station basement or in the court basement, or it may not even be digitized, it might just be paperwork. And they have one system, no redundancy, and of course it's incredibly prone then to a disaster, should something happen. And this is how now with our system we're able to not just simply protect their data, um, but ensure though that we're managing all of the complexities for them everything from the ongoing compliance concerns to backups to, of course, then the ongoing um, software uh, subscription as well. So a few of the applications that we've developed to uh, significantly um, help digitize um, law enforcement, but all these other applications we're developing is we've developed the whole reporting suite. So this is actually in Illinois um, an Illinois crash report. So right now, same thing with ticketing, is if they were to do a crash report, the data would have to be um, manually filled out on a paper-based form. The data would have to then be sent to the Illinois Department of Transportation. We completely digitize that for not just the officers in the field, reducing the typical crash report from 45 minutes to 15 minutes with our system, but then further, uh, our system then sends in real time to the Illinois Department of the Transportation servers the whole crash report data so they don't have to now on the back end manually enter this data. You might not like me for this application for electronic ticketing, but I do promise though um, that this actually makes um, the process I think a lot less painful for residents. Um, so we've been able to reduce the length of a traffic stop by, on average, about 45%. Um, this is actually really important because one of the leading causes of death for a police officer is being actually struck on the side of the road by an oncoming vehicle. Um, this happens all across the country. Um, you know, officers are getting outside of their car on a busy street or a busy highway, um, and uh, it's a dangerous place to be. And so by us reducing the length of the traffic stop dramatically, it's not just enhancing convenience that you can be on your way a lot faster, but it's also really improving safety um, for the officer and even for the driver as well that you don't have to be pulled over for as long as well. Another very powerful thing about our application is that traditionally, oftentimes when you're being pulled over, um, they're going to be radioing dispatch to do a license plate query or a driver's license query and looking up your information. Uh, Quicket as part of our whole um, cloud system, we actually were the first to uh, connect and route all 50 state Secretary of State databases into our system. 
so that with a query within our application, we're actually able to retrieve all the data from any type of Secretary of State database across the country, parse it, and then auto-populate actually all the data onto the citation, uh, report, or any other thing that the officer is working on. So quite literally is if I pull you over, I can do a license plate query and auto-populate about 70% of the ticket automatically. Um, so this is really improving officer safety, um, but then also as you at the end of the day get a perfectly printed ticket now, as you can see here. So it's legible. If you do have to appear at court, you know where to exactly go. And also, many jurisdictions, you, you'll often see it with parking online payments, but for the traffic and more severe uh, complaints that might be issued, um, online payments are oftentimes not available. And so that's another big part of our system is that we um, provide the online payment processing services as well um, to help streamline that process. So now into a lot of more of our um, big data aspects of our system. Um, so once we started digitizing ticket data, um, and, and now we have thousands upon thousands and thousands of tickets in our system, um, but we really realized that you know, by outfitting all these officers with tablets, or if they're using their in-car computer in the field, we're able to get a pretty incredible number of data points actually about their patrol activity as a whole. We're able to see where they're patrolling in the community. We're of course seeing what types of tickets and what types of reports that are being issued. Um, and so we've been able to develop now with our system really for the first time like this real-time patrol analysis on our platform. Um, we're able to now map things like, as an example, where all the different incidents are occurring in the town. Because we're also doing the whole incident reporting as well, um, we're also able to see like where the most uh, retail thefts are occurring. Or if there's a new subdivision is one of, in one of our communities, um, there's a new subdivision going up and we could see that there were a lot of break-ins stealing like the copper pipes and things like that. Um, and so we could begin mapping those so that agencies would be able to adjust their patrol efforts accordingly, um, according to where the most uh, high crime or problematic areas were in the city. Um, the final point is actually really important as well as, um, you know, law enforcement especially. Um, but I think this is important for any government agency is transparency. But law enforcement especially, though, has been under a lot of scrutiny lately. Um, the, the news, of course, has been covering law enforcement quite a lot lately. Um, and there have been a lot of political um, discussions um, about uh, their patrol efforts, right? And so part of what we developed, actually, was um, one of the first capabilities to do real-time traffic stop analysis, where we can actually measure the duration of a traffic stop across different demographics. Um, so we can actually see, as an example, the mean and median analysis of um, African American versus Hispanic drivers, as an example. We can have all these pretty powerful data points about the length of the traffic stop, the reason for the traffic stop. All, a lot of these things are automated, so an officer is just simply, they're patrolling, but we're capturing a lot of that information automatically. And so uh, what that enables is for the command staff to not just be able to monitor patrol efforts truly like for the first time and really understand you know, a lot more about their patrol activity, but now that data can also be shared with the community as well. So when there do become questions about um, how officers are patrolling, where they're patrolling, who they're pulling over, and a lot of other related questions like that, we actually have that data now. A lot of times, officers, chiefs, um, and other members of the command staff are kind of in a difficult situation responding to media and other type of inquiries because they just simply didn't have the data before. Um, and so it's really powerful now that we're quantifying this data, we're providing with them with um, intuitive applications, um, mapping, and a number of other features so that they can see this type of data for the first time in real time. Another thing that we're doing um, is a hotspot analysis as well. So because we're um, capturing the coordinates of where a lot of these incidents are occurring, 
Um, another thing that we're doing to really help out communities is uh, crash analyses. Um, so we're actually now mapping for every community that's live with our platform uh, the location of every accident in town. This wasn't something that they had really before. I mean, they could go back if they wanted to and review all their crash reports to begin to generate some basic understandings. But now is for the first time we're actually able to really do a cluster type analysis here and see exactly where the crashes are occurring. Now this is really powerful because now at like a city council level discussion, law enforcement can provide this data and say, hey, I really think that this area is a very problematic intersection. We should really think about putting a stoplight there. Um, so we, we genuinely believe with our application and we're definitely see, seeing this now um, is by mapping this type of data, we're not just simply um, enhancing uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of operations, but we're enhancing the safety of our communities as well. Okay. So this just kind of visually illustrates ultimately what QuickIt is accomplishing today um, on behalf of our law enforcement, code enforcement, and other customers that we're working with. So in the field now, all the data is being digitized um, with uh, our reporting and other type of applications that are Windows and Android based application. All the data then is shared, seem, is sent real time to our quick, to the cloud so that then all this data then can be shared seamlessly then with all the different stakeholders. So um, if it's a ticket, our ticket then goes automatically to the courthouse. So there's no type of physical delivery. Um, if it's a crash report, it goes automatically to the Department of Transportation. And if it's an incident report, for a misdemeanor or felony offense, that data gets shared and compiled automatically with the FBI as well. Um, and further on top of that then is the whole system then is then managed through a web-based application. So now rather than having an on-premise infrastructure, rather than having a homegrown system to manage all the data, it's all just web-based now. So from any type of computer or even your iPad, you're able to manage all the data um, within the system. So a major implementation that we did um, pretty close to home here was uh, Lake County, Illinois. So Lake County is home to over 700,000 people, um, about 45 uh, communities plus a sheriff's department. Um, and the county, which was a really powerful thing, actually put together a countywide RFP um, where they came together and said, we want to develop some common standards here around uh, how we're going to share data common standards around the interface and the features that ultimately we're looking for. And so um, Quicket, um, as a little startup company, I, um, what was uh, pretty amazing is that we were able to, uh, to beat um, every industry competitor. Some of them are multi-billion dollar industry competitors um, and propose a solution for them to have a unified cloud platform um, for them so that law enforcement agencies could not just simply subscribe to all these different common features that Quicket would be developing, but furthermore, they would have one central place where all the data could then be shared for the first time for every single law enforcement agency in the county. So now, if you're being pulled over in one jurisdiction, or if there was um, a person of interest that they're um, doing a query against, whether it's in one community in Lake County or another community in Lake County, they can see each other's data um, which has been incredibly powerful to be able to do much more effective policing within the communities. Um, to date, we've deployed about a half dozen um, of the agencies within the county. Um, we've had uh, 15 now fully contract and commit with us, so we're probably going to have um, all 15 of them live before the end of the year. But this is just a really powerful example of how um, a, a private and public partnership here can deliver um, an unbelievable amount of data sharing, analysis, um, and other capabilities um, under one unified platform for the public sector. Another use case was um, we recently released our code enforcement uh, platform. Um, now code enforcement uh, is basically anything that has to do with uh, property or building inspections. It could be anything from leaving garbage, <laughs> Pretty, uh, in your yard. It could be um, inspecting a building for fire safety 
Um, a number of things that, um, again, is in the world of government, it's pretty much just paper-based right now. So how Peoria, Peoria currently did it was they'd have code inspectors go to different properties, uh, physically inspect the properties, maybe take a couple pictures with a point-and-shoot camera, uh, <laughs> take down some paper, mode, paper notes, and then they go back to the office and type up a report. Then they drive all the way back to the property, deliver a notice, then they go back to the station again, and then mail out another copy of the notice as well to that address so that they had one copy that was left at the property and another copy that was mailed. So <laughs> we originally were working with the police department and then the code enforcement said, hey, can we, uh, can we do something here? Because um, I, I, we see a lot of uh, potential benefit in uh, adopting the platform for our needs. So now, in modern day Peoria, um, the code enforcement officers are able to simply, with one application, they're able to inspect the property, um, fill out um, all the necessary information about the property, and we actually then migrated every single property record in the county into our cloud. So tens of thousands of records now um, in regards to the property owners, the parcel IDs, and other type of uh, um, uh, information including like the location of the property have now been put into our system. They can query against that property, they can look up all the information about that, auto-populate all the data on the form, and then be able to, if they want to, then print the violation notice right there on the scene. All that data then is synced to the cloud, and we also then have deployed a complete court <coughs> system for them as well, so all the data then goes automatically into our court case management system as well. So all these different functions, um, whether it's in the field, the court, and now if you were to look up your violation online, because the tablets have a built-in camera and a digital evidence management part of our system, all that data now is put in one place. You can easily pay the violation, but then also um, if you're going to contest um, or prove that this wasn't your property, you can go to court and all the data then is shared seamlessly with that system. Okay. Approximately 20. So I'd like to um, show as one of the last things here, um, just a quick uh, client experience video to tell you a little bit more um, from the client perspective about how we've really fundamentally changed their operation. Approximately 20 years ago when I started and even up to five years ago, our department um, uh, was very much behind the times as far as technology. The old way of doing things for us was uh, archaic. It was too time consuming, too many steps involved. So when I started nine years ago, uh, we, everything was done by paper. So when, we, when I wrote a citation, there was five copies I had to give to different departments. Uh, when that citation got turned into court, uh, half the time the citation got lost. It wasn't a very solid system. Quicket brought our department to the 21st century, so to speak. Quicket has made it easier as far as the manual labor that was involved prior to it. A lot of writing took place before. A lot of writing, a lot of data entry. And with the Quicket solutions, that's pretty much eliminated quite a bit of that. My ex personal experience with the Quicket platform as a supervisor it makes my job easier and a lot faster. When we first started using the Quicket Tablet system, we didn't know really too much what to expect in regards to it. Having that software actually be able to adapt to our specific needs of the police department has been excellent. Where it took me 20 minutes to write a citation, now it takes me an average of five minutes. And it opens up my day to do other activities, patrol more neighborhood. I'm able to be a little more spontaneous. The Quicket platform seemed to be one of the better products out there that is able to get us that real-time data that we really need today. For me as a supervisor, it has helped me be able to monitor who's being more productive, who's not being more productive. Before, we as supervisors, as sergeants, never had access to that type of information. 
Now we all do. Quicket um, not only allows the administration, myself, commander's chief, to access that data, it also enables our officers to log in to see what, how they're performing, where in the past that information wasn't readily available to them. And now they could track their own data and their own performance on an actual real-time basis. It would be a, a disaster not to have Quicket. Before our adjudication, you should take anywhere from two and a half hours. We're out of there in 45 minutes. Before, there were paper tickets, and we were unable to see anything. It would just be their word against the violator's word, and the officer's not there, whereas now we have that actual proof and that evidence because of the Quicket system. The cloud is, is, is big in that we don't have to have uh, servers to retain the data. Uh, it's available, it's there, and we don't have to worry about storage. It's been 100% reliable. Every ticket that we ever wrote, it's in the system. We've never had one glitch where we write citation that does not appear where it should be. Everybody that I ever spoke with in the department, they love it. It's, it's you know, like using a cell phone. If you can't use your cell phone, you can't use the Quicket system. Just the support team is awesome. Anytime I need anything, I have Ethan's cell phone number. He answers, he gets it done, whatever I need. He emails it to me. So I have nothing but good things to say about the support team. They're pretty amazing. The Quicket system has revolutionized our police department here in North Lake. It's faster, it's more efficient, and has helped us serve our public a lot better. For those police departments that haven't taken advantage of this Quicket platform system, I highly recommend that they do. I can't imagine being without it. So this was uh, North Lake, Illinois. Um, we had to, it took forever to get the permit for the drone because it's right by O'Hare. <laughs> um, but I hope you, hope you like that. Um, what's, um, uh, why Quicket is so passionate about what we do is we feel like there are so few companies out there that are really 100% dedicated to building applications to make government smarter, more effective, and more transparent with our citizens. Um, Everyone on my team um, is um, so passionate because we, we get to work with these officers and other um, members of these local government agencies on a daily basis and they feel and we know how underserved they are in regards to technology. Um, and so with that being said, um, you know, we definitely believe that this is a very underserved market, but we're very passionate about what we do. Um, and we really believe that uh, Quicket has a lot of potential because um, no one's really yet talking about the cloud and big data yet in local government and Quicket hopes to be one of the first to be able to deliver these type of applications to them. So, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Quick Happy to take question. any quick questions. Mm -hmm. So we haven't yet really um, contracted yet with the federal government. Um, I mean, that's definitely a whole other, um, whole other animal to deal with, but um, we worked very closely and we still work very closely with the FBI. Um, what was so cool is actually working directly with them to get Amazon vetted for actually the first time um, in compliance with what's called the CJIS or Criminal Justice Information Services Policy designed by the FBI. Um, and then Amazon ultimately, because of us taking them through that process, we were recognized by Amazon in 2015 as the most innovative company in the public sector. So at some point, yes, um, but it's going to take a lot of time to, <laughs> to work with the federal government. Well, a lot of ways, actually. Um, so the first thing that I can say is just generally speaking is um, uh, the departments we work with just really um, have an incredible lack of um, technology deployed. I mean, having an on-premise server compared to Amazon Web Services, GovCloud, if we just start there and say that, you know, is we have a multi-billion dollar infrastructure that has geographically isolated data center locations, then on top of that, we're building for them systems with the highest level of AES-256 encryption, whether it's on the devices, in the network, in transit, or on the database 
that whole system we manage and we deploy and we ensure that the data is always protected every step of the way. Um, and even like a couple really interesting things that we only discovered then when we deployed the platform, but because they're a very mobile workforce, they're not just at a desktop computer with an ethernet connection, is we actually had to um, very carefully design the application to support a lot of offline capability as well, so that even when they're in the field with no internet connection, the data can still be captured, but then stored locally encrypted on the device, and then when an internet connection is detected, it's then automatically sent um, to our server. So there's a lot of things to consider, um, but generally speaking, as in comparison to what they have now, um, is we have a pretty tremendous value proposition. Yes, ma'am. A number of reasons. Um, so the the cloud and a true cloud here. Um, so a, a lot of companies claim that they have a cloud, but remotely hosting something, um, you know, in, in their private cloud, um, in their basement, doesn't really um, accomplish that much. So quick at one uh, for a number of things. The number one reason, and I hope this is continues to be a number one reason why you win contracts with government is pricing, right? And so quick at um, is able to deploy so much more cheaply than our competitors because we're not having to physically install and manually provision additional systems um, to deploy to clients. Um, we have one central cloud platform. Of course, we isolate the data for each customer, but we're able to very quickly spin off additional resources to be able to handle additional clients in our system. So price, speed of deployment, security as well. Um, it's pretty amazing that the sector is dominated by solutions that were um, built in the 90s, you know, when information systems were first being developed and they haven't changed much, si much since then. Um, so quite a lot of factors went into that decision making. Yes, sir. Last question. So, yes, and we have to be, though, extremely careful, though, with customer data. Um, so one of the key things that the FBI required us to do in be able to handle this data was very um, explicitly mention that the client owns the data and that we're not going to do anything with the data without their express permission. Um, so like in the Lake County initiative, that was very different because this was 45 agencies coming together um, and all law enforcement agencies willing um, and wanting to share this information, right? But going beyond that is we have to be very careful about um, how we're gonna be using the data. As an example, there is a, um, a nationwide crash report vendor um, that now is in the middle of um, a class action lawsuit here because they were actually selling all of your data to trial lawyers and insurance companies. Um, and that's, of course, not okay. Um, we're very, very protective of the data because it is a tremendous responsibility um, to handle this type of data on behalf of agencies and quite frankly is um, on behalf of everyone here as well. It's a tremendous responsibility to um, uh, be very careful in how we manage the data, but yet at the same time though is we definitely feel very confident that in comparison to the current systems in place that we have a um, a significant number of additional data security controls built into our system. Thank you, Christian. Very inspiring. Thank you.